I'm Francesca Witzberg. I'm a 2014 alum and I'm an intellectual property attorney that specializes with trademarks, copyrights, and contracts related to intellectual property. And most recently, I have really dove headfirst into NFTs, Web3, the metaverse, because it's a really fascinating intersect between law, fashion, art, music, entertainment, culture, and technology, which is what fame is all about. So tonight's discussion is going to be very exciting. And um, with my background, I did begin a few Instagram accounts, as some of you know. So I do have the trademark attorney, which you'll see at the bottom of my slides. And then I also have the central lawyer because this topic has been so relevant. And I know a lot of you here um, are very interested in learning what NFTs are, what the metaverse is and why it's relevant to your business or brand and, and the clients that you're advising. So we're going to really dive into all that tonight. Um, and then I will turn it over to Lise. Thank you, Francesca. Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining. It's great to see so many people uh, interested in the topic. Uh, I'm an associate at Fenwick & West. I've been there for four years. I worked before that in, in Canada, and uh, I did an LLM here in 2018 uh, at Cardozo, and I was a student of Barbara Paulson. Um, I took all the fashion-related classes I could take, uh, IP-related classes as well, and uh, I am now in the tech trends, what we call the tech trends group at Fenwick, and we do a lot of, it, of uh, you know intellectual property and both in M and A and and more on the day to day uh, contractual side, and work a lot with fashion uh, companies. And uh, I agree with Francesca that the topic of metaverse and everything we'll touch on today is, is really fascinated, fascinating, and uh, touches on so many different things um, that we thought it would be really great to. Uh, talk to you about that tonight so we can get going whenever everyone's okay. ready okay great i'm gonna share uh i'm gonna share a clip with everyone first that is going to really just paint a picture as to what the metaverse uh really is so just give me one second okay As the world stayed home during the pandemic, there was still somewhere to go to get dressed up. Welcome to the metaverse. The term may come from science fiction, but the business opportunities in this fast evolving convergence of digital and physical worlds are real. The metaverse has grown out of gaming, where players already spend over $100 billion a year on virtual goods. Three billion people, more than a third of the world's population, regularly play video games. 46% of gamers are women. And across generations, people prefer video games over movies and TV shows, making gaming the world's leading form of entertainment. Dressing avatars has come a long way from battleground beginnings. As gaming emerges as a lucrative channel for luxury brands to reach new customers, Screenware is the new streetwear. A growing trend in this new fashion space, matching real life purchases with a digital twin. New breed creatives make playful tributes to their favorite brands. Real world cities embrace virtual fashion shows and virtual department stores. So don't write this off as a blip. It's a game changer. And we cannot yet know where it might go. Demand for one-off NFTs, unique certified digital assets, is soaring. In fashion, NFTs are the couture of the metaverse, where the unfettered creations of digital artisans can outprice those of global brands. And hyped assets, driven by scarcity, are crypto status symbols. The upside? Measurable planetary savings. Production of a digital garment emits 97% less CO2 than a physical one. The downside? Minting and mining NFTs requires skyrocketing energy consumption in the real world. The shift to more environmentally efficient methods can't come fast enough. Yet, 
Virtual fashion facilitates the expression of multiple selves in a virtual world where brands recreate the experiences that define fashion culture, while not forgetting our eternal joy of getting dressed up in real life. Very cool. Okay, so let's begin our presentation. I'm gonna share screen. One of the things I'm petrified of, back to you asked me earlier, is I'm on every program here. Sorry, uh, that's Gary V talking <laughs> about NFTs. Hold on one second. Let's do not optimize. I've gotten really good at all the share screen, all the Zoom we've had. Um, okay. Lise, can you see this? Yes. Okay. Okay, everyone. So welcome to Trademarks in the Metaverse. Today, we're going to be talking about all things trademarks in the metaverse, but we're going to discuss topics that are broader than that, such as NFTs, Web3, and the metaverse how it's revolutionizing fashion in every single industry, why it's important and why also it's uh, it's dangerous. <laughs> so for those attorneys attending today who wish to receive New York State CLE credit for our program, please record all attendance verification codes announced during the program. In order to receive your CLE credits, you must report all such codes on our online affirmation form that's being distributed to you um, in the chat. Okay, and then during the program, I'm going to be giving a code. All right, so let's begin. Um, I found this quote that was from the fashion law uh, that Nike said, and I think it's really important to show the importance of why the technology is so great and also the dangers. So NFTs are an exciting um, new technology to interact with for their consumers in and out of the metaverse. And there's diverse commercial applications of NFTs that have emerged throughout the past, past two years. But at the same time, NFTs and the metaverse more broadly have become a virtual playground for infringers to us usurp the goodwill of some of the most famous trademarks in the world and use those trademarks without authorization to market their virtual products and generate ill-gotten profits. Okay, so before we have a discussion about the intellectual property issues, particularly trademark issues with the metaverse, it's critical that we take a minute to define the technology and explain what it is, explain its relevance to fashion, and then take a look at the legal issues that they implicate. So what are NFTs? Uh, by definition, an NFT, which is short for a non-fungible token, it's a unique and non-interchangeable unit of data stored on a blockchain. I like this definition better it's a verifiable digital asset. By using blockchain technology in combination with a smart contract, people can create assets that are easy to transfer, give certain rights and things depending on what you put into the smart contract, and it really cuts out the middleman. That is one of the major reasons why this technology is so revolutionary and disrupt potentially disruptive is that it really gives the ability for transactions to be facilitated automatically and uh, very seamlessly while also being verified on the blockchain. So what's the utility behind them? Um, a lot of a lot of the the I would say the first generation of NFT projects were only only really transferring the actual hash on a blockchain. So there's not really much attached to it, right? You weren't transferring copyrights to the photos or the images, but what it really is in an essence without any other contractual language, all it is is a hash on the blockchain that links to uh, a file. It doesn't have to be an image. It could be whatever digital asset, but more and more projects and businesses and brands are utilizing the technology itself 
to give more utility to their to their NFT holders. So a lot of the profile pick type NFT projects are now transferring copyright ownership of the of the JPEG. So you can actually use your image that you bought on merch if you'd like to create it or maybe make a 3D avatar to to use in the metaverse. There's basically no limit as to how creative you want to be to it, be with it. And that's why this technology is really fascinating from a business marketing and branding perspective. So what is the metaverse? The metaverse is a mix of multiple technologies that include augmented reality, virtual reality, and video where users hang out in a digital universe. So the term metaverse came from a sci-fi book, but what what people are referring to it as uh, is really, it's still being built. So people are building their metaverses, right? Like Facebook is building its metaverse, Microsoft, um, there's Decentraland, there's, there's metaverses that are currently being built by companies, but the hope and the goal is that that they will one day all connect and it's going to be a virtual world that's parallel to our our real world and so for those of you that don't know augmented reality think of pokemon go it's 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 the virtual reality that has like a filter above uh, our reality so instagram filters snapchat filters um holograms so that technology is already being implemented currently, but think about it, you know, there will be a point in time, actually it's already here with DressX. Uh, you can download the DressX app and you could shop virtual clothing and with your camera actually see how that piece of clothing, the virtual clothing looks on you. So that's an example of augmented reality. Virtual reality is completely immersive. So that's when we see the Oculus headsets, you see the people wearing them. Um, it's VR is where you're completely immersed into another virtual realm. And, you know, video in general, we're meeting, you know, in a metaverse as, as we speak. So I want everyone to just really understand that this technology isn't so futuristic and so complicated. And Oculus is really just like an Android over your eyes. Um, and so it's, it's, it's not that far-fetched. Okay, now what is Web3? So Web3 that everyone's been talking about. Before I can explain what Web3 is, uh, let's, let's define Web1 and Web2. So Web1 is the first stage of the internet it, with static web pages. Then Web2 was the evolution of that stage of the internet. Mm -hmm. So that's where we see user-generated content being important in social media. Web2 also marks the era of centralization. So where most tech platforms are centralized and owned by big companies like Google, Meta, and Amazon. But Web3 is the next evolution of that internet where people hope that it will be more decentralized, giving access not just to the Amazons, the Facebooks, I apologize, the Metas and the Googles of the world, but really will allow uh, everyone to create whatever software that they want. And it really is based on blockchain technology. So the purpose of that is that the blockchain would verify transactions and so that you don't need a centralized third party to manage those transactions. Think of what, so, you know, when people talk about it in the most basic sense, Web3 is just the next evolution of the, inter of the internet. And uh, it really is based in blockchain technology. Okay, so now we talked about what NFTs are, what the metaverse is, and what Web3 is, but let's go back to NFTs. Why are NFTs so important? NFTs are a really cool thing in terms of culture and society. NFTs in an, in essentially are social tokens. That's really what we're seeing with this first generation of the NFT projects. It's really hip culture and community building. So people who will buy Bored Apes, I, I'm, I'm sure everyone or most of you have seen these now. This is one of the first uh, NFT projects that 
really went big and partnered with Adidas. Uh, a board ape could cost you 300 grand and up. Uh, they're very expensive. And so people, I know, you know, you guys are probably thinking, why would anyone want to pay for a small JPEG that you could right click, right? That's, that's the question I keep getting. So the reason why it has, it has such value is because it had, it's a social currency. To be able to say you own a Bored Ape is like saying you own a Lamborghini. And now you're going to ask me, but Francesca, if I own a Lamborghini, I can drive that Lamborghini. Well, when you own a Bored Ape, you get access to exclusive club access and exclusive communities. So it really is up to the, to the creators of what access they want to give their holders. But it could range from anything to group masterminds, to conferences like Gary Vee does, to actual merch that has um, both the Adidas merch and Bored, Bored Ape. There really is no limit as to uh, what the technology can do. It's the limit is as creative as creative as you can be. So um, this is something that people who understand the technology are realizing that there's a lot behind this. The new generation that's coming up. I mean, I had my first son in 2020 and he I we FaceTimed from the hospital, right? So these the new generation is exposed to technology so early that businesses that are marketing and trying to figure out who the consumers are and what the what the gen, what the popular generations want it's digital and what they want is they want digital goods and digital social tokens it's really interesting but we do have to kind of understand its relevance and so I'll anticipate another question is Francesca, what's the what is the difference between me paying three hundred thousand dollars for a board ape and me right clicking and save? And I will answer that the difference is the difference of you owning a Picasso and you going on Google images and right clicking and saving a Picasso and putting it on Instagram. OK, anyone can do that. But to, to have that bragging rights that that clout, they call it like to flex online and show that you own um, one of these very coveted blue chip projects. Um, people can tell and not only can they tell. So if you bought a Picasso, there's no way to tell if you really owned it, right? But with NFTs, you can actually tell all you need to do is go check on the blockchain and, and you will see who is the real owner. So that's just a little bit of background. Um, they also are linked with smart smart contracts. So a lot of people, what they do is they give royalties in the smart contract. They include a, um, a provision that says that every time there's a sale, that the original owner gets a percentage. So they get a royalty. Now you can imagine with all of the transactions, there's there's some serious money to be made. So another way it's great is because you can do partnerships and collaborations. Um, so Board Ape became a brand in and of itself. Um, <clears throat> and they've done various partnerships. And then likewise, it was a great way for Adidas to kind of enter this and be co-branded with them, getting all of that goodwill and that publicity and the PR. It's, it's something that holds value. And there is a vast potential beyond digital art which uh, which we can talk about. Uh, there was one other example I wanted to give when people say, OK, well, why would I want to have this? Um, th you know, think about this. If there's anyone in here that d d advises businesses and brands from a PR or a branding perspective, <clears throat> if you're going to pay, if you're going to do a deal with Jay-Z to wear um, a, a bespoke suit by a designer, OK, you're going to pay a lot of money. And Jay-Z is going to wear it one time. Maybe the pictures and the photos, you'll have them. But of course, with Instagram feeds and everything, it's, it'll get buried eventually, right? People are going to lose interest in that. But if you do a deal with a celebrity and they make your your NFT with that features your brand or your product as their profile picture, that's huge. That, that value lasts longer than that one instance of Jay-Z wearing 
you know, your, your product for one special night. And the same goes as to the value of the holder. So instead of buying um, an expensive bag, you know, you could maybe invest where, where you may only wear it once or twice or however, however much, you could also instead buy an NFT that's gonna give you access to community and to all the other perks and um, any other perks that the NFT project is, is giving. Okay, so why is the metaverse important? So I think augmented reality with the example of filters and also potentially holograms, which are going to be a thing. I don't think the, I don't think we're there yet. I think that technology is just like a little too early that people will be weirded out if, you know, we did this and Lisa and I are just like standing in your living room. Um, <clears throat> but it's it will be happening at some point when we're ready. And virtual reality, uh, virtual reality is really interesting from like a social communications perspective, because think of how we communicate. It started with letters before there was the phone. Then there was the phone. Then our phones could text. Then our phones could take videos and you could be walking and, you know, taking videos and seeing each other in real time. But now with VR, you could literally be sitting at um, it, at by the Elf Eiffel Tower in France with your best friend, and I could be in New York, and my friend who meets in Ireland, we could meet in France in VR. So, not only is that kind of just cool and interesting, but it's really a new business model and revenue streams for for uh, businesses. So, I'll, and I will give a fashion-related example. So the cost to develop your own fashion line, to put on a fashion show, to then uh, have people come and attend the fashion show and then meet with buyers, make orders. It's, it's extremely cost prohibitive for a lot of very talented creative designers. So imagine that now a designer could create virtual clothing that they will meet with you know their team and then put on a virtual show where people come that's minimal overhead and then you will be able to meet with your buyers instead of having your buyers fly all over you know during the the, the fashion weeks um you actually could just meet with them and they could see how the clothing looks on avatars and then purchase orders. I mean, I feel like a lot of people in here that is kind of relevant and maybe um, <clears throat> piques everyone's interest because this technology really is going to be uh, game changing for a lot of creatives. So why is Web3 important? And Web3 is just kind of a general term. Like I said, it's the, the X evolution of the Internet. And a lot of a lot of software and mobile apps are going to be coming out on Web3. Um, there's already new social platforms where it's linked to cryptocurrency, so you could actually pay people in crypto while using the, the software. Uh, it's also decentralized in theory, but we're still seeing a lot of the Web3 platforms being centralized and less regulation. I put with a question mark because as we lawyers know that the laws are going to be applied into this space. This is not just, you know, it's not like the internet was invented and everyone said, oh, okay, now we need all new laws. No, our laws were created pre-internet. We just need creative and smart lawyers and judges and courts to um, navigate this, understand the technology, and now apply the laws to the new tech. Okay, so <laughs> we talked about what the technology is, why it's important. Um, let's talk about how they're, they're revolutionizing fashion. So one of the major, one of the major things that we're going to see coming out of the metaverse and with NFTs is virtual goods. So <clears throat> as I said before, DressX is a great example. You know, you can download the app and designers will do a deal with DressX to get their clothing sold on on DressX, which is a virtual goods marketplace. And right now on DressX, you can have those filters that I mentioned. So if I had a filter, okay, 
I have a filter in my background, right? Like the there's blur, it's blurry, but I could be in a filter that has makeup that I wear. Um, I could be having a filter that has a jacket that I love, like a nice luxury jacket. So you can see this market really opens the door, not just for, for anyone, uh, this market opens the door for anyone because we're all online and this technology isn't going anywhere. Zoom is probably not going anywhere. So imagine if you know you didn't have to spend a ton of money on the actual physical good, but you could still have your favorite jacket on while giving a presentation or meeting with a friend um, on, on video. So we're seeing that. Also the concept of dematerialization. So the fact that instead of having to buy a ton of clothing, which we all know has environment has environmental implications, virtual goods has a sort of, um, you know, dematerialized uh, connection to it. Um, okay, and then I, I do want to mention though that with all the technology that there are also environmental factors like all of this you need to have all of this on servers so there's an energy component behind all the technology but just just highlighting that um and then you could have new or second streams of income so if you're a fashion brand and you've only been doing physical goods you can partner and have your physical goods also link to an nft or you can have a digital clothing line that's parallel to it or if you want to be a startup designer and you don't even want to do physical goods there's designers coming out right now that are only doing digital digital clothing and again you could do collaborations and partnerships and there's a low overhead and expense okay i just want to see how we're doing on time okay so uh, this is an example of NFTs and fashion. So, you know, we've seen Burberry, Louis Vuitton, a lot of big brands have already done partnerships with NFTs. And <clears throat> this is Artifact, which now, um, now Nike now owns. And so these shoes, if you could see, I can't see, I have my screen in front of it. Y yeah, so 6.9 ETH is is significant money it's the market's been fluctuating but i mean these these shoes sell for tens and hundreds of thousands of dollars and they are um they are digital but some of them also have a physical component to them it's literally whatever the creator wants to do um i'm gonna skip some of this because we do have to talk about the law <laughs> so the metaverse and fashion example this is this is kind of a fun one so i've been talking about dress x just because they're a really big um business in this space so to the left this is a screenshot of what it looks like if you're in the metaverse with you know your your vr headset there's a virtual built mall that has a dress x store that you can go in and buy clothing in the form of NFTs. And then I screenshotted, this is their website. So if you do want, you did want to buy some of their clothes, um, it would be, um, the way that they do it here is kind of interesting. You could buy their clothes and then you send a photo of yourself and they Photoshop it on you. So then I guess you can use it on Instagram and all that, okay. And then I think the slide just important because where to earn is something to understand. So um, <clears throat> we all know how influencers became really important for brands to pay influencers to wear their stuff. Now with the technology, you can actually set up the, um, you can actually set it up so that people will like where to earn. So basically if they are wearing your virtual goods, they'll earn money for however often or however long you're wearing their <clears throat> virtual goods. And you don't have, this is all done on the blockchain. It's all done automatically. So that's just really interesting technology. Um, and I'm gonna skip this. Okay, so <clears throat> before we get into the legal aspect, um, I'm going to announce For those attorneys attending today who wish to receive the New York State CLE credit for our program, please record the following code. The code is Metaverse 
0303. In order to receive your CLE credit, you must report this code and any others that we give you that we give out on our outline affirmation form that is being distributed to you by chat. Again, please record the following code. Metaverse 0303. One final time, and it's all one word. Metaverse 0303. Okay. All right, so now that you have seen what the metaverse looks like, you know what the NFT technology is, what Web3 is, um, and the metaverse, let's talk about some of the legal issues that we are seeing in the fashion industry right now. And from a very high level perspective, clearly intellectual property is one. So Lise is going to really go into depth on some of the trademark issues because that's why you all are all here today. And we're gonna talk about two important cases that are related to trademarks. So we're definitely seeing IP issues. And that first quote I gave at the beginning where yes, this technology is great and amazing as we just saw, but also it's rife for infringement. And what I'm seeing is as I'm advising these clients, there's there's this misconception that just because it's related to art that you could still just use people's trademarks and brands and images. And so we're definitely, this is not, like, Meta Birkin is not the, is not the only, not the last case I believe that we're gonna see um, navigating that intersection between First Amendment, fair use and art and also with balancing brand protection. Securities is also a huge concern. People are wondering <clears throat> if NFTs and cryptocurrency is going to be considered a security. And then the decentralization. There's a ton of pros in favor of getting middlemen out, out and being able to facilitate things seamlessly, but also cons. How are you going to enforce intellectual property rights on purely decentralized platforms for one. Okay. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Lise. Thank you so much. I'm not sure what I see. I see a small oh, version no. and the bigger version. <laughs> That's all right. Um, thanks so much, Francesca. Uh, you know, I, I read the, the slides and listened to you before, but I thought that was really an amazing presentation, like an you know, introduction to uh, our presentation here. So Obviously, you know, there are many issues that will come up uh, and some we don't even know about yet or don't think about yet. And we wanted to touch on two main uh, questions that we've seen that already came up, uh, mo mostly in two recent cases that I'm sure you've heard about. Uh, the, the Meta Birkin case that uh, Francesca just mentioned and uh, the Nike uh, case against uh, StockX. So uh, to illustrate those two main uh, issues, uh, I'm going to go over those uh, those two cases in you know not not too much details, but still um, discuss some, some of the main uh, questions. And we'll see that the main questions come up in, in both uh, cases and will come up in, in many more. So the the first issue that and both of them are very much uh, tied together. But first one. First question is, do, do companies' trademarks rights in the traditional world uh, extend to the metaverse? Uh, and then, as a, almost as a follow-up to this question, how will trademark protections for uh, real-world items uh, be enforced in the metaverse? And what remedies could be granted uh, to uh, IP owners whose rights are being infringed uh, in, the, in the metaverse? So, um, to go through, yeah, I'll go through, I'll briefly introduce the Meta Birkin case and then discuss some of the issues that um, came up and then move uh, to the Nike case. So I'm sure you've heard of, of the Meta Birkin case already, but for those of you maybe who haven't or are not you know, really familiar with it, uh, I'm gonna give just some uh, very uh, high level background. So uh, LMS sued in January, so it's you know, very recent that they sued uh, uh, NFT creator 
that creator uh, created a collection of 100 uh, NFTs of, uh, they, they, he called those uh, NFTs of that collection Meta Birkin um, in, you know, as a reference to the Birkin bag, the famous uh, Birkin bag. For those of you who might not know, that bag was um, introduced, first introduced by Hermes in the 80s. Uh, and named after the English actress uh, and singer Jane Birkin. So it comes from, from there and became this, you know, really famous, really well-known uh, bag for which uh, AMS has a trademark uh, registered. So um, what the creator here did is he created a uh, hundred, as you can see here uh, on the photo, hundred NFTs with like different um, colors and uh, materials almost, at least, you know, we can see it looks like uh, fur and like full fur and different, um, just, yeah, all sorts of different designs and graphics. And uh, the first one was sold back in uh, December for $42,000. And since then, the total volume of sales uh, is like ab above a million dollars. Um, so I think we can understand why uh, LMS is kind of, uh, you know, is a, is a little concerned here. Um, so what they argue, what MS argues is that the defendant is, is breaching here uh, their trademark rights by, by using the term uh, Meta Birkin. What's interesting is that he's calling the collection Meta Birkin, but that's not all, uh, all he's doing. He's really using that uh, trademark as a, as a trademark, as an indicator of source for uh, everything that he uh, offers or at least, you know, several things that he offers and not just those NFTs. Since then, he's actually um, advertised new NFTs, also uh, referencing referencing the term uh, Meta Birkin, even though those are not uh, th those bags. Um, he's also using Meta Birkin as uh, his uh, handle on Twitter and Instagram, and uh, he operates the website metaburkin.com metaburkins.com so it's it's really uh kind of the the, the entire business is, is called metaburkin and ms ms argument here is that it metaburkin just means murky Bir birkin in the metaverse uh and it's just straight straight reference and in, in use of their trademark uh birkin um then you know directly linked to that uh ms talks about uh, consumer, the risk of consumer confusion here. And uh, they actually point to actual cases or actual examples of confusion because uh, when the when this was the those NFTs were first uh, created and released in, in December, um, some newspaper actually I think Elle and New York Post, uh, those actually uh, reported that MS was actually directly involved in the creation and the launch of the collection, which uh, you know, we know is not the case, but uh, clearly that was not obvious to uh, everyone. And um, so something, in, in, an important point to mention is that MS is not, has not yet minted any NFTs. They are not yet in the space. Uh, but one of their argument is that so many companies are, so many luxury fashion brands uh, are exploiting already the NFT space. Um, or you know, considering it and, and being active and talking about it, that um, it is not actually uh, crazy to imagine a potential connection and endorsement uh, between the fashion uh, brands, like a luxury brand like Hermes and uh, NFTs. So in terms of, you know, if we go back to our question, um, if, how, how or will Hermes rights, trademark rights in the real world uh, extend to the metaverse and can they base their claim uh, and successfully base their claim on their uh, existing rights? Um, how will the courts, you know, um, obviously we don't know that yet because it's really the first or one of the first uh, cases at least involving a, a large fashion brand like that, but um, will they uh, Authorize, you know, uh, the MS to base their their claim on on their existing rights. Um, so, you know, interestingly, and as I'm sh I'm sure a lot of you know, but 
trademarks uh, you really need to apply to when you register, although you can have common law rights. So I'm going to put that on the side for a minute. But um, for trademark applications, those are uh, applied for uh, and obtained for specific classes of uh, goods. And so generally, trademarks only apply to the goods or the services that are listed in those uh, in the registrations that you apply for and that you um, obtain. So Hermes has a registration for Birkin in class 18, just leather and imitations of leather uh, goods. Basically. So really, you know, not 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 directly like NFT. Um, so now they only to prove that uh, their trademark rights in their real world in class 18 for leather goods uh, extend to an image, the expressive image that's based on those goods, uh, which is what the Mida Birkin trademark is here selling to um, consumers. So they will need to show that um, the use of, you know, in the metaverse, that uh, in the way that the creator here is using uh, the, the Mida Birkin trademark is a, a natural expansion of their uh, trademark rights in the, in the real world. So, um, if you we, want to talk about that, at least as we sure. were talking the other day, yes, about definitely. like at least Lisa and I had like a really interesting conversation that you know, talking about this, that we realized there's practical, there's the legal arguments, and then there's practical um, strategies on how to try and minimize the risk. So, when it comes to trademark filings, like Lee said, you know. You could be a clothing brand, which if you have handbags and uh, if you have handbags, that's class 18 for trademarks. If you have clothing, that's class 25. But now let's say if you want to sell virtual handbags and virtual clothing, or you want to defend your rights against someone who's selling your virtual clothing or your virtual handbags, those goods are being classified differently because as I explained earlier, what the metaverse is, is it's still software platforms. Like if, any, if anyone has, has used an Oculus here or has used these platforms, to access the metaverse, you can use the Oculus hardware and then you download apps just just like you're on your computer or your phone so you have to end you have to download the software and then go in and then you could actually buy the virtual goods in in the game or in the in in the platform and it's the same thing if you're accessing instead of using you know your vr headset you can also some of them you can access on your desktop right 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 now so most most of the this technology is being in is in class nine um, for downloadable software, class forty two for non downloadable software, and uh, <clears throat> if you have some cryptocurrency things related to it, class thirty six, and that's a non exclusive list. It's it's more complicated than that, but I'm just giving you some examples. So you know, Lisa and I were talking. As a pr trademark practitioner, I'm telling clients you should be filing for those. Like, why wait to have to defend your rights, or why wait to decide you're going to enter the metaverse and then have a problem? Uh, you can be proactive, which a lot of brands are doing, uh, which you can see from the, the headlines. They're filing applications in those additional classes. Yeah, no, that. Thank you, uh, Francesca, and that was a very you know interesting conversation. And I also you know I feel like as you've probably you know a lot of you've probably heard in the last few months, even days, there has been so many new applications for uh, you know from existing companies for um, existing trademarks, but to expand uh, to new classes. And so I feel like in a way now um, maybe the argument that you didn't need those new applications. Uh, a month ago or so is not is is not really um, the fact that there are so many applica new applications is kind of hurting that argument I think because now it's like well you know everyone is actually applying for new trademarks and you should just hop on the train and do the same um, so definitely uh, agree with Francesca that in terms of um, you know why why not why not do it and uh, it's so much probably much more, uh, much, much less expensive to do that and to uh, have to deal with the consequences afterwards. And 
I think what's interesting is also to know, you know, it's not like there is NFTs are not listed in the international classes of trademarks, right? So it's like also trying to um, see under which classes to file for those goods. But there are um, definitely a few classes that 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 come up, uh, keep coming up, and generally uh, brands are filing under uh, 35, 36, uh, 41, 42. Those are the classes that uh, are for downloadable um you know goods or uh business services technical services things things like that to uh really you know it's expand the the application the registrations to more than just a leather product leather goods for example in the case of uh ms here um yeah. can i add something lise of course so when i'm doing like when i'm doing these like, trademark filings for clients it, it's important if you are a practitioner or advising clients to really figure out what they're doing. If you have a client that says to you, we need to preserve our rights in this space, you know, you, you can go broader, but um, if they're actually using a crypto marketplace is going to have a different description than an NFT project which is going to have a different description than a brand that's only doing NFTs or a brand that's doing some sort of partnership where there's NFTs and also physical goods. So this is why it's not a one size fits all. Like here's, here's the classes that you check off. You really should take the time to understand this tech. It's not overly complicated, um, but it is important that we understand it as lawyers in order to properly advise clients and, and be creative in this space right now. So if we, I, move, I just want to move on quickly uh, to uh, the defense, because uh, in this case, the, the NFT creator filed the uh, defense, uh, not, not yet in the Nike case, but, uh, and, you know, really is claiming fair use here. And so, um, you know, according to, to him, um, it's, uh, and I think, uh, Francesca, if you can move a few slides, I think uh, some, uh, it's not the defense, but it's like a Twitter, something he posted on his Twitter um, soon after he received. Uh, I don't, I actually don't know that the uh, the claim had been filed yet, but first, uh, Alma sent a cease and desist letter. And so uh, he, he posted that on his, on his Twitter and really arguing that this is a playful abstraction of an existing fashion culture landmark. Um, basically, same thing as uh, what gave uh, Andy Warhol the right to make and sell art depicting the Campbell's soup cans, and that uh, this is really uh, just um, fair use here. So um, MS's response to that is that uh, First, you know, the fact that this, he's an artist and this is art does not, you know, they say it does not, does not confer a license to use an equivalent to the famous Burton trademark in a manner calculated to mislead consumers and undermine the ability of trademark to identify LMS as the unique source of goods sold under the Burton mark. They also argue that um, he's not actually entitled to fair use protection because uh, the he uses the, the MS marks here in connection with advertising of uh, the metaverking uh, NFTs, and that this is a commercial, uh, commercial in nature. Um, and then also the fact that, as we discussed uh, briefly, briefly earlier, but that he's really using uh, metaverking as his own trademark to uh, reference uh, his the offerings of his uh, NFTs, the NFTs that he created. Um, then he's barred up from using the uh, fair use uh, defense here. Um, so if we move on to uh, the Nike case, we'll see that you know a lot of those questions are also um, discussed in the claims. You know, it's also trademark infringement, dilution, unfair competition. But there are some slight differences that are that are you know interesting here. So. First of all, here, as you can see, um, and I'll just give you a little bit of background on, on the case, but as you can see, you can really see the Nike trademarks, and those are actually existing. It's a representation of existing Nike models. So uh, Nike sued uh, Stock StockX for trademark infringement, uh, dilution, unfair competition back in January. Um, 
of this year. Uh, no, sorry, in February, I believe, and it was in January that the, the, the NFT, the, that line uh, or collection of NFTs was released. So StockX uh, released a line uh, depicting nine different Nike designs. They called it the Vault Collection. Um, and as you can see, it shows the, the Nike trademark. So StockX claimed that each NFT is actually linked to a physical sneaker that it's that is stored in the uh, StockX facility, which uh, StockX says like will allow customer to buy and to resell the shoe without having to pay ship shipping fees or storage sp space fees or um, things like that. Um, according to Nike, that that uh, in their complaints, uh, which was filed in February, they said that StockX had sold almost 600 NFTs uh, that each are trading for thousands of dollars. Uh, so a lot more than the shoe, uh, the physical shoes itself. Um, they alleged that by doing that, StockX infringed uh, the, the nine, like nine of its design. Uh, to create the, their their line like that vault collection, they also you know same as uh, as um, AMS, they also point to uh, consumer confusion. They gave examples of cases where um, consumers actually thought that you know this was a collaboration with uh, Nike, um, and also they say the same way as uh, AMS had had argued, that uh, they say that this. This deprives uh, Nike of its exclusive rights to use its own mark in connection with uh, this new commercial medium that uh, NFTs are. An, Im an important point here uh, to mention is that um, Nike mentions a lot of their uh, existing trademark registrations in the complaint. Uh, and But they also mention one that they filed back in October for uh, you know, NFT related products. They fact they actually so they unlike MS, they actually filed a few months ago for uh, trademark for using connection with uh, downloadable virtual goods, namely computer computer programs, featuring footwear, digital sneakers, NFTs. They included that in their uh, in that application. Another uh, interesting, you know, point. Obviously, Nike here has a particularly strong incentive to avoid brand confusion uh, because last year, back in the December, I believe, they acquired artifacts, which um, Francis, Francesca talked about earlier, uh, to create, obviously, its own crypto collection. So um, having that, those NFTs uh, uh, come out now and, and them not being involved uh, is, is you know, potentially, or not potentially, I think it is really problematic uh, for them from a marketing perspective and, and just you know, clearly shows that they don't control the space, and um, and and you know that's why they want to um, obtain. Like they they ask for an injunction to get uh, all of those uh, take, take it, taken down, which I'll touch on uh, in a minute. Uh, their defense is different from um, from the defense in, in the MS case, although they haven't yet filed their like a full response. So you know, we'll have to wait for to see exactly what their uh, arguments are. But they did issue a statement um, a few, uh, I believe it was you know soon after the sometime in February, like maybe two weeks ago or a week ago. Uh, and you know what they say in this statement is that uh, they undoubtedly have the right to provide their customers with this new an innovative approach to trading current culture products on StockX, and they plan to vigorously defend their position. They say that StockX Vault NFTs are not digital or virtual sneakers. They do not state or imply that their Vault NFTs are associated with, sponsored by, or officially connected to any third-party brand, and in fact, they clearly and express, expressly state the opposite. Um, so they, Again, they have not filed their and their uh, answer here, but they appear to be basing their argument on the first sale doctrine. I won't dig that you know too much into this, but you know at a very high level, um, you know this doctrine means that marketplaces can resell goods and display images of those goods that include obviously the trademarks of those goods without having to uh, without needing a license to do that. 
So here what StockX is basically uh, saying in their statement or at least implying in their statement is that they have the right to have a marketplace where they can display goods, including Nike goods. And uh, here they're just fundamentally doing the same, uh, same transaction, uh, but they're just making an NFT to stand in the place of the physical shoe. Nike uh, disagrees with that uh, and they actually address that already in their uh, complaint and they touch on uh, the, the including on different things, but including the difference of the price between uh, the actual physical product and uh, the price at which the uh, NFTs are sold. Um, so again, you know, this will be it will be interesting to see how this plays out. We will first uh, have to wait for. Uh, I, I believe that uh, um, StockX they asked for uh, an extension to file their uh, answer, but it should come pretty soon. Um, and so, last point I wanted to touch on is uh, in terms of the, the remedies. Uh, so, what's interesting here, Nike is seeking uh, some in you know, interesting remedies because, again, that's like part of the question, right? What remedies can uh, brand owners uh, ask for here? Um, so here they are asking for uh, an order that StockX be required to deliver to Nike for destruction any and all uh, Vault NFTs, associated footwear, and digital files. Um, so you know it's it's a little bit it's intriguing and Francesca, I'm curious to you know get your thoughts on that. But in the world you know of NFTs, the because of the immutable nature of blockchain, the the digital tokens cannot be destroyed without dismantling the blockchain uh, entirely, right, on which uh, they are hosted. So this basically means that uh, the best hot, like outcome here uh, for a brand would be seeking to have the NFTs um, burn, like uh, sent to a burn address. So it doesn't actually mean that they would be destroyed, but it means that they would no, no longer be transferable. And that possibility for uh, holders of NFTs to resell those NFTs is really essential to the value of the NFTs. So that would, you know, even if we can really talk about destruction, that would uh, really uh, take away a big part of the value of the NFTs. But uh, again, that's what they are asking for. Now it will be interesting to see uh, what remedies uh, courts, if this goes to trial, um, impose here. So. I'm actually hoping that this these cases don't settle because I want to know uh, what the courts would say here. It's they're law school exams. Yeah, totally. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad I'm done law school though. <laughs> I don't have to do those exams, but no, these are interesting questions. Two fascinating cases. So, Lise, um, I think. Right? Do you have anything else to comment on, or no? We... You know, no. I think that's uh, you know that's enough, uh, and we can maybe open to questions. Uh, I'd be curious to see what people, you know, questions people have. Yes, we'll open it up to questions. Um, I guess we can do them in the chat. I already see a couple, so if you have more questions, ask. Um, I want to take one that was sent directly to me, and it involved the bona fide intent to use requirement. So that is something, of course, like I, I said, how brands could be filing in those classes. But you're absolutely right. There isn't a bona fide intent to use requirement, which I, I, I if a brand is just trying to file to preserve rights, I mean, what's the difference between a brand just filing in random classes without any actual real intent to expand into the metaverse? So I think that's definitely going to be an issue and you do have to push back on clients. Um, and that's why when I said earlier, when I advise clients in this space, you have to drill down and say, okay, but how are you using it? Because it's not a just check all the boxes. You have to actually figure out what categories and how, how the client is intending to use it. So very, very interesting um, point that we'll see play out, but hopefully all the brands that are filing actually do have intense, intent to use and, and plans to enter the metaverse. Okay, let's see. So then someone asked, do you believe the first sale doctrine will eventually be applied to subs subsequent 
sales of NFTs. And I know, Lise, you talked about first sale, but you yeah. also said it's like, it's... It's even fun. implied, right? It's not, you know, it's, it's implied in that short statement that they, that, you know, it's honestly, I, I don't know if it's going to be, it's so hard to comment on that at this stage, I, I feel. Yeah, and also, no pun intended, but it's a gray area of the law, gray market <laughs> goods. <laughs> and really, like when I think about this from from a technology standpoint, the, the reason why NFT technology is so revolutionary is because of its authenticating technology. The fact that you can sell something and it's actually verifiable. And I didn't talk about this, but there's there's great crazy statistics about the the high number of art that's actually counterfeit because you're relying on humans to authenticate things versus with nft technology if you link art and assets and all and, and physical goods to an nft you have a what we would hope is a very legitimate verifiable chain and you're able to make sure that your products are authentic i really believe that nfts are going to be matched with luxury goods and products so that you can confirm that the product is genuine but then the stock stock x case comes up so but what happens if you're not the brand owner that's connecting the nft to the goods? What happens if it's someone who bought the goods and then wants to make an NFT and verify it that way? That's what we're seeing play out right now. And it's super fascinating. And I really hope that the court rules, um, uh, think they will, they'll think of the future because this technology is really not going anywhere and the potential of it will be um, very important for luxury brands and fashion brands and all consumer goods industries to link NFTs with their products so that you can verify it and, and use the technology to help prevent counterfeit goods. Um, okay, so someone said, I realized I realize that filing in these virtual world classes outside the USA may be important for for enforcement but in the in the usa do you think a class 25 registration for apparel will be sufficient to stop a user in the metaverse selling digital apparel using the registered mark and this came from mark lieberstein hey mark least do you want to begin sorry i'm just i missed the beginning of the question oh he's at he's basically asking do you think five yeah if a 25 is gonna help prevent um metaverse sales for I think, you know, it's very close to the 18, what we discussed for 18, right? Um, so, you know, there are definitely arguments that 18, which is, you know, leather goods that we discussed or 25 clothing, you know, those would be sufficient uh, according to some, you know, some people because it would be their use in the metaverse would be a, a natural extension. It's still clothing. It's just in the vir virtual world. Um, so, you know, that's that's an argument now, you know, so many brands are applying for a protection, additional protection that I would definitely recommend uh, applying for uh, more than just class 25, just class 25, but also uh, class nine or, um, you know, and as Francesca was saying, carefully uh, looking at classes to see what makes sense, uh, both based on the product uh, or service and based on the intending use in the metaverse. Uh, but I would definitely recommend not to limit it to class uh, 25. I would argue, like, like if you're a physical goods company and you have no intent to enter the metaverse right now, you know, we talked about that requirement. So you technically can't file applications to preserve your rights if you have literally no intent. But I would still make the argument as the brand or the lawyer representing the brand that absolutely look at all of the luxury goods brands that are already doing partnerships selling high-end luxury goods in the metaverse it's here it's an extension and definitely i think we're going to see more and more collaborations and um i believe that you, i would argue absolutely that your physical goods um, should prevent sales 
of uh, digital goods. Now, that may have given away which side I fall on in the Meta Birkin case, but also then there's another argument clearly as we're seeing play out is that no, these, these are really just creative forms of expression, but I think it's really, Mark, I think it'll be case by case um, specific if it's, if truly people are benefiting and it's clear infringement, um, I would still make the argument and, 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 and push because what's happening is there is a ton of infringement happening right now. A lot of NFTs, if you look at the, at the marketplaces, are just clearly using people's brands and logos and images. I had someone ask me in a in a in a Twitter space the other day if he could take a pack of Pokemon cards and make them NFTs. And I had to explain no, because number one, Pokemon is probably, you know, they, they're gonna do something like that. If they haven't already, I don't know. Um, but also, if you you can't just take someone else's IP and and reproduce it. Now I know that there's so many caveats to that, and that's why we're here tonight, and that's why there's these cases with great lawyers on both sides of both cases. So I like least hope that they don't settle, and we'll get some uh, some clarity. There's a follow-up here from Alex to, to that same question. Uh, Alex is asking, did sports apparel brands file outside of 25 video games, like Madden for jerseys? Some did. Um, well, Nike actually did. Nike, they uh, recently, but they they started doing it because, uh, you know, since I believe it was in 2019 that they did this collaboration with uh, 2K Sports for, uh, you know, the makers of the... Uh, NBA 2K basketball uh, video game, and um, I don't they don't didn't file right away, but they filed in October of 2021. 20, uh, they um, filed for uh, different uh, new like several new classes. I don't have the exact numbers, but it was definitely um, some that apply directly to uh, the metaverse uh, and didn't limit it to uh, clothing and, and sports. Uh, other goods that they already had in their applications or in their registrations in. Um, okay, I know we had like a bunch, but we're all we're coming up at time. Um, I let's let's just um, give maybe like one takeaway, at least what we think. Not even about the cases, but like what what's your take in general on this space? If you had like one takeaway, um, I'm gonna give mine, and this is very important. As much of an enthusiast as I am about NFTs, I am enthused about the technology. There are so many projects right now that are absolutely overhyped, overpriced. It is it is analogous to the dot com boom that there was a bubble and it burst. So no one be surprised when, you know, six months or however many months there's going to be this bubble that's going to burst and everyone's going to say, oh my gosh, Francesca, you talked about how great the technology was, but now everyone's bailing. And it's because we are only seeing the first iteration of these projects, okay? It's, it's the same thing like with the internet. Facebook didn't come out of the first iteration of the internet, the technology evolved, people got creative, people took the first, the second um, inspiration, and then they created Facebook, and then they created Instagram. And it's going to be the same thing. So how brands and businesses internalize the tech and think creatively of how they can apply it to their business, their branding efforts, their marketing. That is why NFTs, the metaverse and Web3 is so revolutionary. I agree. I agree completely. And, you know, I, I, it's not going anywhere. So I think we're all educating ourselves a little bit at the same time. Uh, so I would highly recommend just, you know, keep reading about it. Keep, you know, it, I find it fascinating. I hope you do as well. Uh, I feel like, you know, even if you don't, it's not going anywhere. So I would highly recommend to just, you know, keep, yeah, keep learning about it. And, and I, and also take all of the, buzzwords and information with a you know grain of salt and really do your own research because um, I wouldn't really take any 
source as like none of this is gospel i would really uh, read as much as uh, from different source sources different industries also uh, it will apply differently uh, in, in different industries so i think it'll be interesting to see the application uh, of it in, in uh, different worlds yes I know we covered a lot, but I hope that this was informative and fun. And if you, if anyone has questions, feel free to reach out to Lisa or I. And thank you, Barbara. Thank you, Jamie. Thank you, Madison, and everyone, Janet uh, at Cardozo for putting this on. And maybe we'll do an event one day in the metaverse. <laughs> thank you. Both of you were excellent speakers and great Cardozo grads. And thanks so much for, for enlightening us on this very complicated subject. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Thank you, Barbara. Thanks, everyone.